Hi. The plan tonight was to do another upgrade on the APU and uh, we had installed the more sophisticated mufflers as well as replaced the motor generators with smaller, lighter, more efficient units. Uh, the plan with much more resistance load was to run this thing at a one or two kilowatts and produce some fuel consumption numbers as well as show you what the vibration and the noise levels were like. However, right now in New England, it's about five degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and that's just too brutal. And so with that in mind, we're going to wait a little bit on this. And in the meantime, I'm going to do a video on some rather amazing speakers that I just built. And it started with a couple of weeks ago, the work that we were doing with the active uh, sound reduction began playing around with these little Dayton $6 audio exciters. And when I attach these things to some trash, literally trash, and played music through them, I was stunned. The, the quality of the music that came out of this was not at all like a $6 speaker. It sounded like a decent bookshelf speaker. So I went to the Parts Express website where they have a um, project gallery. And a guy named Rich did a really nice write-up on what are called DML, or Distributed Mode Loudspeakers and went through the whole process of uh, sizing them, building them, constructing them, and at the end has a couple of very sexy looking speakers mounted on a pair of artist's easels in his living room. And based on everything that I've learned subsequently, I believe him when he says that they sound really nice. You go on YouTube, you see another couple of examples of people doing this, and so we just couldn't leave that alone. So like everything that we do here, we began a rather deep investigation to see just how good we could make speakers using this technology. Now, if you remember in the acoustics video we did a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the importance of phase relationships. And in a typical listening room, when you have two speakers on opposite sides of the room and you're sitting in between them, both speakers are working together in concert, so to speak, and it produces a very nice sound. But what happens as you move laterally in the room, you can envision the triangle that's formed by, between the two speakers in my head, is becoming distorted. And as I move closer to one speaker versus the other speaker, the distance from this speaker is becoming longer, this one shorter. Eventually, I reach a point where the distance between, the differential distance is one half wavelength at a particular frequency. And at that point, you're in a node. You get almost no amplification, almost no sound. And as you continue to move laterally, you'll reach another point where you're one and a half wavelengths lateral to the center spot. As you move across the room, you're going to get these peaks and these troughs of sound ampl amplitude. And that really creates regions in the room where it's not very good to listen to the sound. In addition to these, in addition, these speakers, because of their conical shape or their spherical shape, act a little bit like shaped uh, anti-tank charges. They focus the sound in front of them. So when you include the focusing property of the speakers and the phasing property of the speakers, you get a lot of regionality in the room. And even if you're using, say, ribbon speakers or electrostatic speakers, which don't suffer from the, the shape factor, you nevertheless are always going to be suffering with an, a, a phasing factor. And that's why these speakers here, which are based on a distributed panel, have a really unusual, rather unique property of very little amplitude variation within a room because the sound that you're hearing, instead of coming from a very small discrete source, is coming from the entire panel. And it's interesting, if you sit in a very high quality listening room and you're listening to very good quality speakers, you might say, man, that sounds really good but you can usually still always tell that the sound the vocalist is coming from, say, that box in the corner. There's a localization. But when you come into a room with these larger panel speakers, it's a lot more like putting on a high-quality pair of headphones. You still get left and right separation, but you don't have that focalization. It's, maybe it takes a little bit of getting used to. You may not like the feeling or the sound uh, through headphones, but that's more a matter of taste. It's not so much a matter of quality. And personally, I like it more. One of the things that the manufacturer recommended when building speakers like this 
is to use a material that has a very high compression strength, but a very low bending strength. In other words, it's very flexible in bending, but very stiff in compression. The compression makes sense. You're not going to couple a lot of energy from a little module like this when it's attached to foam. So you want something with high compression strength, but you also want something that's going to be able to flex and bend and vibrate in order to produce the sound. The property of both being stiff and flexible is really something that you usually don't get in a single material. With the exception of the end grain balsa, every material that I've tested and every material that I could locate has those sort of properties not working in conjunction with each other. I decided to ignore the recommendation of the manufacturer and test a huge variety of materials to just find out what would be the best materials. And so I attached these actuators to plates of steel, glass, aluminum, brass, polycarbonate, acrylic, pine, oak, resonant spruce. I attached them to fiberglass. I attached them to gypsum or drywall. I also attached them to structured materials like plywood, both the cheap fur stuff from the big box stores, as well as the higher quality marine plywoods like Maranti and Akumi. I also attached them to balsa wood, like I talked about there, as well as uh, materials like cardboard, a plastic variation on cardboard, uh, I believe it's called Corlite, and to Nomex carbon fiber honeycomb, I've attached them to sandwiches of uh, fi um, carbon fiber and urethane, as well as to polyethylene, polyurethane, and polystyrene foam, uh, both the extruded and the expander. The expander is lousy because little white BBs fall all over and you can't get the actuators to stick to them. The very best materials turn out to be resonant spruce, which is the same material that they use to make uh, guitars and piano soundboards. And there's actually a company in Eastern Europe that builds speakers, expensive speakers, very much like these using resonant spruce. End grain balsa is excellent. The extruded polystyrene is excellent as well as what's called pallet board, or it's a type of cardboard that has a hexagonal inner mesh as opposed to the sort of wobbly type of uh, inner corrugation like you see on typical boxes. The polystyrene was the very best and produced very good quality sound, but tended to have more amplitude in the higher frequencies. The end grain balsa, again excellent, but tended to be a richer sound, produced more amplitude in the lower frequencies. The cardboard was almost as good as these two materials but covered the same covered the entire range in one material and finally the resonant spruce was just about as good as the cardboard however you want the largest panels as we'll discuss that you could possibly afford and building large panels out of expensive soundboard it could be prohibitive so what we did once we discovered what the materials were is we started testing the different panels and in order to do that, I've hooked them up to a computer as well as an amplifier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how these panels actually work in real life. Something I want to show you before we begin the test is that I have the computer set up with the equalizer absolutely flat across the middle. We're not cheating here and we're producing as accurate a reproduction of the sound as the speaker can. The first panel that we're going to hook up is going to be the worst example of the solid materials. All of the solid materials tend to have a ringing component to them. They tend to vibrate, and what that does is it muddies the sound. So the first speaker that we're going to hook up here is going to be that plate of aluminum over there. And so when you hear this, take a listen not only to the sound, but take a listen to the sound after the segment plays. problem with the solid materials and as a result you don't want to use any of them. The better material that uh, I have identified which is the extruded polystyrene is very good in producing the high frequencies but because it has damping 
it doesn't ring. And so the notes, the sound peaks, don't run into each other and you get very crisp separation. The manufacturer also recommends rounding the corners and easing the edges. What this does is it helps to reduce some of the resonant peaks that you get in these panels, and we're going to discuss that a little bit later. They also recommend doing something to the surface of the panel, which is to sand it. When they make extruded polystyrene, what happens is as the polystyrene uh, comes out of the, the die, the surface, the lips of the die, create a very thin film of hard uh, plastic on the surface. As a result, it makes the panel stiffer in the bending direction and reduces some of the benefit of having the, the resonance or the, the vibration of the panel. In addition, the softer surface that you get by sanding off that thin layer of plastic acts as an acoustic absorber, so in a listening room, it actually improves the listening environment as well as helping the panel to produce better sounds. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hook up this speaker and you're going to take a listen to this relative to its alternative in the aluminum. Just unplug the aluminum. other good quality material that I identified, which is the end grain balsa, has very good quality, but it also produces more uh, lower frequency sound. It's a richer sound. And so I'm now going to play this panel over here, and you're going to hear the difference between the two panels. something a little bit about the way the speakers work and why the size is so important. The larger the panel, the longer the wavelengths that it's actually able to support in a vibrating, resonating mode. And so to get the lowest frequencies possible, you want the largest panel that you can put in your room. The problem is sometimes you don't have enough room. And so if you create a panel that has a much larger dimension uh, that can fit, say, on the side of a monitor or in, a, in a tight space, you'll still get some of the improvement of the lower frequencies. Not nearly as much as if the entire panel is large, but it's better than just limiting yourself to, say, a small rectangle if all you have is this much width. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play this polystyrene panel. This sounds pretty difficult to distinguish from the polystyrene panels. It's not quite as good, and I'm assuming with all the uploading and compression and downloading through YouTube, you're probably not going to hear the distinction. You can hear it, though, and so unless you have to use cardboard, I tend to use these other materials as we'll describe later. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to play uh, a short segment that is going to have both speakers working, both the balsa and the polystyrene, as you might have it set up, say, in a stereo uh, installation in one of your rooms. Okay, now both speakers are hooked up, the balsa and the polystyrene, and you can hear what it sounds like. Keep in mind, we've got five watts. 
20 watts running in a room with about 14,000 cubic feet. These are very efficient. Now, these speakers at this point are very good. We've got a couple of thousand dollar floor speakers that we use in this big projection room. And they're almost as good. Not quite, but they're very close. And the question, obviously, is can we make them any better? Almost every speaker that you've probably ever heard and speaker that you've ever owned is based on this technology. And an interesting thing is that if you were sitting in an audience in this room and I was playing a piano and forget the acoustics, forget my skills, you'd sound like an idiot if you said, wow, that sounds so realistic. It's like there's a real piano in here. The music that's produced by a musical instrument consists of the vibration and the undulations and the movement of the entire instrument. And the piano soundboard, the guitar back, uh, the violin, they're all shaped in particular ways in order to produce the best quality sound. They don't work like little pistons moving in and out to try to fake it. And so what these speakers are doing is essentially following the same sort of technology. They're vibrating and undulating just like a real musical instrument is. So if we want to bring this up a notch and make these speakers even better, what we have to do is we have to improve the panels as musical instruments. Now you've probably seen these in physics class, and if you go on YouTube, you'll see what are called cladney plates. And what they are is flat metal plates attached to audio exciters, which are in turn powered by an amplifier and a tone generator. And what they do is they demonstrate resonance in materials based on the frequency response of the material to different inputs of um, impulses from the audio exciter. As you run these things, you'll hear a sound. Right now, you can probably hear a low frequency vibrating sound. And as I up the frequency, you'll hear the ramp or the sweep through different frequencies. Now the plate resonates at certain tones and produces a lot more volume, but you can't see that. So in a typical cladney plate, what's done is the surface is covered with a particulate matter. Usually what they do is they use anodized plates and they cover them with sand. But because I want to do this demonstration quickly, I just decided to paint some thin plates. And instead of using an abrasive sand, I decided to cover the plate with sugar and the sugar will bounce around on the plate as it's influenced by the audio exciter and move around. And as it moves, it will tend to move most at the places where the plate moves the most. And it tends to settle in the vibratory troughs that occur when the plate resonates. That's pretty good. Now, I'm gonna turn this on and you can start to see some of the particles vibrating. As I begin to ramp this up in frequency, you'll find there are certain frequencies where the plate resonates, the sound becomes left much louder, and you'll see patterns begin to form on the plate. Between resonance peaks for this particular size and stiffness plate, sand doesn't move very much. When it reaches another resonance peak, you can see that it moves substantially and forms different types of patterns. As I continue to ramp up, different patterns form. But again, between the peaks, not a lot of movement, 
because the entire plate is moving sort of randomly. Here it gets louder, and the, and the sugar begins to move. Now, visually, that's beautiful, but acoustically, that's lousy, because that means that you're going to get peaks in the volume coming out of the speaker at those resonance peaks, and you're not going to get the flat response you want from the panel. So one of the things that the manufacturer recommends doing is not cutting these plates perfectly symmetrically, but cutting them as a rectangle. The idea being that there are going to be two resonance peaks for every one of a square panel. And because the entire plate doesn't participate at any particular resonance peak, the amplitude, the amount of sound that you get, isn't as peaky at those different resonance positions. So more peaks of lower amplitude is much better. In addition, the manufacturer recommends that you don't place the actuator right in the middle. You actually offset it according to a, a three-fifths, two-fifths rule. And what that does is instead of producing two different frequency modes, you produce four. So you've got one different frequency mode in this direction, two different frequency modes in this direction, and two different frequency modes in this direction. So now you have four. What we decided to do is to carry this much further. And so we modified the plate according to the manufacturer's recommendations, but then carried this further by adding counterweights. And the counterweights are positioned in an interesting way. You can look up uh, interesting kind of mathematical formulas, but it turns out that if you follow the same three-fifths, two-fifths rule with the residual uneven rectangles that are formed when you place this actuator, the individual rectangles are again divided in a three-fifths, two-fifths, three-fifths, two-fifths division. And what this means is that each one of these counterweights is non-redundant in position relative to the edges, relative to each other, relative to the actuator. Consequently, we get dozens of different resonance modes by doing this. You could potentially, say, cut holes in a monolithic plate to achieve the same thing. You could put struts across a plate like piano makers do. But this is very easy. And as a rule of thumb, the amount of mass in the counterweights is approximately 20 to 25 percent of the mass of the whole plate divided into five different weights. So this particular Cladney plate is going to be set up alongside of its partner over here. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover it with sugar just like we did the other one. I want to get my finger grease on this little double sticky tape holding it down. And you'll notice that I've actually got this side of the panel lifted up a little bit because the plates are not obviously balanced on the actuator which is holding it up. And it would tend to tip down and touch that upper right corner. Now I'm going to place sugar on here and I'm going to add some sugar to the other plate too. I'm not using the best shaker in the world, but what the heck. Okay, this is science. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by powering both plates out of the stereo output of the amplifier so they're both receiving the same amplitude and the same frequencies as we ramp or sweep up through the frequencies. And what you're going to do is you're going to watch the sugar carefully. Now you can see it's vibrating over all the plates, but as they start ramping up, you'll notice that this unsymmetrical plate ha continues to vibrate its sugar when the other plate is dead still. It's producing a lot of amplitude at that point, while the other plate is not producing much. And as the other plate moves through its resonance peaks, you'll notice that it has a lot more movement, but at many fewer spots. The smaller plate is still continuing to move while the other plate is not. It's not producing much sound amplitude and it's also not producing much motion of the sugar. This continual vibration of the sugar on the other plate means that we're getting much flatter sound response. We want the peaks to come from the music, but we don't want these huge peaks that occur when that particular plate is in a resonance mode. And you'll see the other plate is not doing that. 
Now, it's not visually appealing, but acoustically, it's a far better way to do this. And it's that continual motion of the sugar on the right hand plate or right hand to me, but a lack of tremendous amounts of movement at certain resonance peaks. You see that plate, the square plates, nothing's moving. The right plate, the sugar still does. The right plate is still producing a good amount of sound amplitude, the left is not. And as we go a little bit higher, you'll see all of a sudden, the left plate is going to begin to dance. But the right plate, not so much. And you hear how much louder it gets at that point? But the asymmetrical plate just keeps vibrating. And remember, we're producing speakers, we're not producing colladenic plates. It's kind of a neat experiment. Now with this in mind, and all the information that we've gathered, I decided to go ahead and build a couple of loudspeakers for our own use in our home. Let me show you what they look like. Okay, to construct the speakers, what I did is I used all of the techniques that I described inside. I built these speakers out of two panels. The top one is polystyrene, and the bottom is the balsa to get the higher and the lower frequencies. In addition, each of the panels has an actuator or an exciter mounted on the back. And because the exciters are 4 ohm, they're wired in series to produce an 8 ohm speaker, which is what most stereos or receivers want to work with. The speakers themselves are hung from monofilament fishing line, so you can't even see it. And they're put on these hooks on the wall so that the speaker systems are isolated from each other as well as isolated from the environment. And the only other connection to the environment are very, very thin silicone uh, insulated wires that are very, very flexible coming off the actuators. Something you'll notice is that this is not ugly pink. You can paint polystyrene with any spray paint as long as you keep the nozzle more than 40 centimeters away from the surface. The xylene and the acetone that normally will eat up polystyrene evaporate before the paint gets to the surface. So as long as you keep that distance, any paint will work with polystyrene. You will be somewhat wasteful of the paint, and I used nearly a full can of paint just to paint these two panels, but the results are very nice, and the color obviously is very appealing. The balsa looks so nice, unfinished, that I just left it that way. In addition, you'll notice that these two speakers are located on either side of the monitor and are essentially no, lar no uh, more uh, extensive into the room than the monitor itself. The final thing just to keep in mind is that these speakers right now are running a, uh, a frequency range from about 130 hertz up to about 20 kilohertz. Even the very largest speakers panels that you could get, which is probably four by eight feet, will not produce good reproduction below about 120 hertz. So with this type of system, it's advisable to use a subwoofer. Uh, that is a crossover at around about 150 hertz, and that will give you a nice, even response through the full listening range. The individual speakers, however, do not require a crossover. They do that with their materials. So let's take a listen and hear what this sounds like.
you build better speakers? Possibly. You could certainly buy better speakers. But keep in mind that these speakers weigh about five and a half pounds each. They are less than two inches deep. And each speaker costs less than $30, including the hooks on the wall. So with that in mind, and the fact that these speakers are so flat, you could imagine that not only two, but maybe four, six, eight speakers could be mounted in a listening room. You could even hang these speakers horizontally from a ceiling. And you can imagine the acoustic control you might have if you were to do that. So this is a lot of fun, and I do promise you that we will get outside as soon as the weather gets a little bit nicer, and we will do the review on the APU. But in the meantime, I think I'm going to watch a movie. So thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you soon.